Hello, um, I'm happy to be here today with Sarah Carr, who is one of 27 artists featured in our upcoming show, Fresh Talent. This is the second year we've done this juried show and we had um, Greg Robinson of Bainbridge Island Museum of Art as our guest juror this year. Uh, so Sarah, I'm, I'm glad to meet you uh, online and hopefully in person shortly yes. <laughs> as well. Um, my name is Deborah Rosinski. I'm the executive director at Bainbridge Arts and Crafts, and um, we're here to learn more about your work and process and how you've come to, to this point and what you make and some of the why behind what you make. My name is Sarah Carr, and uh, I was actually born and raised in West Virginia. I've only been on the West Coast for a couple of years now. Um, I've lived in Pittsburgh, I've lived in Boston, I've lived in Philadelphia, so I'm, I've been sort of semi-nomadic my whole adult life, uh, and I've done a lot of different things during that time as well. So my degree is actually in cultural anthropology, and that sort of interest in traditional cultural processes uh, is definitely integral to the work that I do in fiber now, um, but I'm also a trained dancer, so I have that aesthetic of movement. And I feel like my love of line, sinuous kind of dancing line comes from my background in movement as well. Um, but I did in 2017, just made a big change and sort of dedicated myself to art over the other things that I was doing. Uh, and that was really when the work that I'm doing now started to emerge. I, uh, as part of my art minor, so I was an anthropology major and an art minor, I did a lot of weaving and also took spinning, dyeing, and felting classes with Michael Kornfeld at Marshall University. So it was just sort of chance that this program existed there. And it was really chance that a friend of mine took a weaving class and said, hey, Sarah, <laughs> you should check this out. It's really cool. Uh, because I had no idea that the school even offered that. But on the third floor of one of the admin buildings, there's this loft area with these beautiful dormer windows. And there were just these gorgeous floor looms, like 15 of them set up. And you could just go up there and be in the beautiful light and just work. You know, it was a very calming, peaceful place to be in the middle of the chaos of my college education. So that really instilled the love of fiber in me. And uh, Michael Kornfeld introduced me to felting. We did just a tiny little bit of it, but I was really struck by the properties of wool. It's almost really magical when wool gets wet and warm. And then especially if you add some soap, it becomes almost like clay and you can do really amazing things with it. So that sort of started my journey and that process over many years just kind of evolved to the aesthetic and the process that I have now. Yeah, your pieces really um, have a lot of kind of movement feeling in them, um, the way you're using line and form and color. Um, so it's interesting that you have a dance background um, and it, it sounds really wonderful that you were exposed to all that equipment and, and knowledge. Um, there's so few places that have rooms like that with looms like that. Um, yeah, it's true. And the interesting thing about the weaving program at Marshall is that um, Michael Kornfeld, who was for a long time the um, dean of the art department, but he inherited the equipment and learned how to use it. And he himself and his wife, like back in the 70s, maybe even the late 60s, became, you know, very... Uh, active in the weaving and textile art community that was growing at that time because that resource was there. So when we think about, you know, trying to increase interest in traditional arts, so much of it is just having access to the equipment and being exposed to it because here's someone who transmitted their knowledge to me and they wouldn't have had that knowledge if there hadn't just been a room full of looms. <laughs> Where is Marshall University? It's in Huntington, West Virginia. So that's down in the southern part of the state. 
I, I wanted to ask you um, some of the uh, things I've, I've read online about your work and process. You mentioned that uh, there was a, a health event that you um, had that has played into your work a bit or your work has helped you through it. Uh, do you mind sharing some of that experience with us? Sure. So I would say before 2004, I was doing a lot of felting, um, working with textures and resist, uh, creating sort of landscape um, abstracts. Um, but in 2014 and actually into 2015, I had a really bad fall and the fall actually was bad, but it didn't seem bad enough for the symptoms that I got from it. So I was eventually diagnosed with post-concussion syndrome, uh, and it was really just devastating. I'm a person who kind of lives in my head and I'm very organized and I like to get things done and I just, when I try and describe to people what the experience was like, I just remember standing in my kitchen and I wanted to make something to eat. And I looked at the refrigerator and I looked at the stove and then I looked at the counter and I just kind of slowly kept turning in the circle because my brain couldn't figure out what steps were needed and what order to put them in. So it was just really devastating to go through that. And uh, one thing that really, really made it worse was screen time. So all of the entertainment, all of the information uh, that I was used to accessing with screens, I really had to stay away from that for a period of months. So felting was really a way for me to be able to focus on something and feel productive at a time when I really couldn't do much at all. And at that time, I was just working on something and I... I made an edge on one of my landscapes that was kind of irregular and I didn't like that. It wasn't perfect. So I cut it off and I noticed that where I had layered the wool with the resist to make pockets and shapes that I had this kind of stack of collars. So that mistake and that process was kind of the aha moment. And that's actually how I work. I create these laminated felts with many layers and then I cut strips I cut a whole, you know, four by three piece of felt into tiny strips and then I reassemble them and working the strips together, kind of um, creating the pattern as I go, it just felt very soothing to my brain. And I could sit and do that for hours when there really wasn't much else that I could stand to do. I couldn't read either. It was, it was really just all art all the time. <laughs> well, it it, it sounds like a great way of kind of imposing order on chaos or exactly. you know, um, where are you gathering most of the materials that you use um, commercial sources or. Yeah, so I do get uh, some dyed felt from commercial sources um, since gosh, like 20, 2012 or 2013, though, I get all of my undyed fiber, my gray fiber and my brown fiber. Um, from the sanctuary farm in Michigan. And I really love getting wool from there. So the sheep are just kind of, you know, rescued from other places or places where people are retiring. And sometimes she rescues sheep from auction and things like that. But the sheep just live on the farm. They just live out their lives. She doesn't breed them. She doesn't sell them. They're never food and they all have names. Mm -hmm. And so when I use that fiber. I know the names of the animals. I know this is my favorite one ever is Baxter. <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> but I have, but it, I mean, it's really amazing. So like uh, I bought, there was the sheep pixel that had this beautiful uh, kind of gray brown fleece. And I bought pixels entire fleece, sent it to a processor and got it back as roving. And I still have bags and bags of that fleece and it's been probably a decade. It's just amazing how much fiber one sheep really produces, so. Yeah, that's wild. <laughs> I guess uh, it grows quite thick and. Yeah. Yeah, and so on the sanctuary, they just get sheared once in the spring. So mm -hmm. that's a very heavy fleece. In commercial fleece operations, a lot of times they'll shear twice a year. Mm -hmm. 
And they also usually coat their sheep. So the sheep wear little coats on top of their own fleece to keep them from getting vegetable matter in them. Huh. So the fleece I get isn't as clean. You'll find like little bits of hay in it. I've heard that the sheep actually like to stand under the feeder when they throw the hay in. So they get like a rain of hay down. <laughs> <laughs> huh, I wonder what they like about that. <laughs> I don't know. They're real characters. I and mean, you can, you can follow this sanctuary where I get my fiber, uh, like on Instagram and see the sheep shenanigans. That's just so <laughs> adorable. <laughs> Wow, yeah. <laughs> that sounds soothing as well. A surprising mm -hmm. additional aspect of what you're doing. <laughs> well, very cool. Um, well, we're glad to have found your work and to, to have it in the exhibition. Um, it's quite a range of work that we're going to be showing um, uh, wall work and sculpture and craft media, uh, a variety of craft media. I'm excited to see everybody's work. And um, how long have you been in the Seattle area or, um, or where are you be based exactly? <laughs> I'm, I'm in Seattle. So I live kind of close to U District uh, Roosevelt, right in that area, close to Ravenna Park. Um, but I moved to the West Coast in 2019, right before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So I was in uh, Portland for about a year in lockdown. My partner and I had moved across the coast and he was working at PSU and we found this little cottage to live in while we were looking for apartments. And then we ended up staying in that like 200 square foot cottage for the entire lockdown. <laughs> <laughs> so there wasn't a lot of felting going on in that space so uh yeah I feel I have a really great setup now where I have dedicated studio space in my home and uh it's great as I was talking to another artist about the benefits of the home studio and like easy access to snacks is <laughs> <laughs> it's right. key to, it's key to productivity <laughs> Yeah, it's it's nice if you can work that out. My husband is an artist and I'm an artist and we always have places with garages and the garages never hold cars. <laughs> always, it seems like a waste. You know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Why does the car get its own house? <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so uh, do you, you teach a little bit as well um, or you it's a combination yeah. of teaching and making that you do? Yeah. So back in 2017, uh, I also got really into producing theater. So I have this dance background and periodically, like I started in college, I had done some uh, large scale fiber sculpture integrating performance. Um, so uh, for a while, I sort of got away from doing that. But in 2017, I put together a group and uh, did some fully produced full length shows in Philadelphia while I was living there. Uh, and I got really into puppets and masks at mm -hmm. that time. So that's mostly what I've been teaching here in Seattle uh, through Coyote. I teach puppet design and build and performance. And then I've also in the past taught uh, some classes working with reclaimed and recycled materials to make puppets and masks. Uh, and then I've also just taught regular sort of fiber classes, hat making, things like mm -hmm. that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Are you um, still involved in a, a group called Weftworks? Yeah. yeah, so that's just uh, the name for my theater company. And the last thing I did uh, was a puppet slam in Portland when I was there in, uh, that was in 2020. So I'm just sort of gearing up to produce again. It's so hard, you know, to, I just don't quite feel comfortable with the indoor performance and indoor rehearsals, asking other people to be vulnerable like that and just not sure that I'm ready for that. And it's a big risk. It's a big investment to produce a show and have that ambivalence about it. So, yeah, the arts really were hit harder than a lot of other sectors for those reasons during COVID, uh, live performance and yeah. all of that. But um, 
I know it's slowly coming back, but it's so hard to know what's safe anymore. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's kind of to the point where I feel okay wearing my N95 and going to a performance, but then they drop the mask mandates. <laughs> Right. Yeah, <laughs> now I don't really feel safe anymore. So yeah, it's hard. It's hard to know what to do. It's definitely a different world. It's pretty amazing. And for me, you know, I, I left Philadelphia in 2017 and my partner and I actually did a cross country trip by train. We went all across the top of the country. And the justification for that was in the middle, we stopped at Minneapolis and uh, did a performance at the um, National uh, Puppeteers Festival. So we're like, we'll just take the train and then take the train and keep going. Um, so <laughs> wonderful. You know, it, it was, it was a trip of a lifetime. Uh, I had actually owned a business. I owned a Pilates studio for nine years and doing something like that, being a business owner, I don't think I ever took more than three days off in a row during that almost decade. So it was sort of like the saved up vacation from all of that time. But you know, I had that wonderful experience of sort of having time to enjoy things and then getting to see so many things that I hadn't seen before. Went to so many national parks uh, and really just saw a lot of inspiring beauty. And then, you know, that trip ended in October <laughs> of 2019. And I thought I was getting ready to start this new chapter of my life. And well, boy, I was, it just wasn't the <laughs> chapter than I thought. So, you know, a lot of people have this sensation of sort of before and after and with the pandemic. And for me, that before starts a little bit earlier. It's really like what happened in 2017, 2017 2018 was sort of the cutoff <laughs> for me and like, everything has been so unsettled since then. So mm -hmm. I'm waiting for things to sort of find a new pattern, but still kind of up in the air, really. Mm -hmm. I guess it, it's helpful at getting us to live in the moment, <laughs> maybe more than other times in life, at least for me. <laughs> yeah, that is true. That's an interesting point, too, because I feel I'm a very, very focused planner. I almost enjoy planning things more than actually doing them. <laughs> I, I really like to make lists, you know, make detailed lists. This is what's going to happen and when. This is the schedule. But the really interesting thing is that my art and my approach to art is completely different. So... I sort of start with collars. I let them inspire me, you know, a palette that sort of just speaks to me. And then I make the felt and I start cutting and then I just see how it goes, you know, see what happens. And uh, another really interesting thing about the way I work is I almost always construct things sideways, rotated 90 degrees from the way I end up thinking they should be displayed. And I don't know if this is another weird thing about my brain, like <laughs> from the post-concussion syndrome or, um, but it just always happens that way. So as I'm putting things together and making design choices, I'm actually making them from a different perspective than the way I'm viewing them. Hmm. And the word you used was a collar, like on a, a shirt? <laughs> no. Or, I want to uh, make sure I heard it right. Red, blue, green. Oh, colors. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. It's hilarious. I don't know why I say the word that way, but everyone always makes that same mistake with me. <laughs> it's not just you. Because colors. they are raised up sort of with edges. And I thought that yeah. was, maybe that was it. But, oh. And I should clarify. <laughs> That's why I said palette because yeah. it's common confusion. I don't know. I have so little accent from all the places that I've lived, but that's just one thing that no one ever understands me. <laughs> oh, it was only that one word. <laughs> just one word. <laughs> You've been very clear. Is there anything else you can think of that you would like people to know about your work or, um, or come away with after experiencing your work, perhaps? I create images. Um, to me, art is communication. 
it's me saying something. Sometimes I'm saying something to myself and sometimes I'm just saying something. The thing is I love leaving the interpretation open. I love for people to see my work and I love it when people get up close and really examine the details. Um, but I really want people to just be free to experience the emotion that the image produces without feeling like they have to understand what's going on um, or what my intention was. Because to me, once I produce the image, it doesn't really matter what my intention was because I've accomplished what I needed to by making the art. And now it's really up to the viewer to decide how the art makes them feel. You and I think separate experiences, aren't they? They are, they're completely separate experiences. And to me, that's sort of analogous to how uh, my communication experienced this very abrupt uh, severance during my brain injury, right? So the things that I was saying sometimes wouldn't make sense to other people. <laughs> and I feel like a lot of art is that way. And even when art is created with intention, there's no guarantee that the viewer grasps that intention. So you have to sort of be content in the expression because that's what art is. And then the dialogue may be different than what you anticipate. And I really love that about abstract work. And I think a lot of, um, a lot of people, I was, I was once at the Philadelphia Museum of Art in the contemporary galleries and someone said, I just don't understand modern art. <laughs> and I just wanted to say, you don't have to understand it. You just have to look at it and think, how does it make you feel? And that's just what I want people to get from my art is just look at it and think, how does it make you feel? Well, we look forward to having your art in our space along with um, 26 other artists and uh, to see you at the opening reception and um, yes. get to talk to you a little bit more. Um, thank you so much for taking the time today. Uh, to thank you for listening to me. <laughs> well, thank you so much for talking to me today and uh, contributing to our growing archive of video interviews with Northwest artists and we're getting close to 60 interviews and I'm really excited to share all these conversations with our audience and folks who come across us and searching on the web. Um, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me. We hope you'll make a point to stop in to see Fresh Talent 2, our second annual juried show this year juried by Greg Robinson of Bainbridge Island Museum of Art, featuring new artists to the gallery, 27 in total, on view from October 7th through the 30th.